Hi, I'm Logan Medish, your host of the High Caliber History Podcast, and my guest on today's show is a student of the era of assassination, which spans from the late 1800s to the early 1900s. And in fact, she is so enthusiastic about this era that she actually went so far as recreating some of the period body armor and bulletproof vests from that time to see how they withstood shots from different types of weapons. One of the types of armor that she tested actually could have been in use at the very beginning of World War I when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. And so part of her testing was to figure out if something like that had been worn by the Archduke, could we have prevented the entirety of World War I? This is an episode you're not going to want to miss. And as a reminder, this podcast is entirely viewer supported. And so if you've enjoyed the episode so far and you'd like to see more like this in the future, please consider subscribing uh, and supporting us through Patreon. There will be a link in the description below. Thanks so much and enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the High Caliber History Podcast. I'm your host, Logan Medish, and on today's show, our guest is Lisa Trainer. She is the Curator of Firearms at the Royal Armories in Leeds. She has a degree in History, Heritage, and Museum Studies from the University of Huddersfield, and she has interned, volunteered, and worked for a variety of institutions, including the Leeds Galleries and Museums at Temple Newsom. Museum Sheffield, the National Trust, and Lancaster Castle before coming to the Royal Armouries. When Lisa became curator of firearms at the Royal Armouries Museum, she finished her research into inventor Casimir Zeglin's silk bulletproof vests in connection with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which became a book titled Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the Era of Assassination, which is the focus of our show today. So Lisa, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me, Logan. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Thanks for taking some time out of your schedule to to join us and do this. So let's let's start off uh, with some some basics. What made you want to work in museums? How did you get into this field? Well, I, I wasn't in this field until um, fourteen years ago. Um, before working in museums, I, I worked in restaurants. So I, I did chefing. Um, restaurant managing I'd I'd always had a love of food that was one of my passions but I also had a love of material culture and old stuff so digging stuff out of grandma and granddad's house um you just have how does this work what on earth is this for why have you kept it kind of thing so I, I was always interested in I'm always interested in history but kind of the stuff that made up history so when I was, it was about, I was about 26 and I'd been working in restaurants for a long time. My first job, like a weekend job, was when I was 13, washing pots in a restaurant. So I was pretty tired by, 20, <laughs> by 26. <laughs> I so bet. I thought, I'm not going to be able to survive into my 40s. I need to do something else. And this is something I have a really big passion for. Always a big visitor of museums, heritage sites. Um, so I wondered how I could get into it. I realised I needed a second degree, um, went back to university to study part time doing the history and heritage and museum studies. Um, so by doing it part time, it was good because I got to do the part time volunteering as well. Loads of different institutions. Sure. Because um, to get into this game, it's not just having the right qualifications. You, you need to show that you, you understand and you can actually do the work too because it's yeah. so competitive so competitive yeah but you know so that's what i that's what i was doing um, for a good five five years working part-time in a restaurant um studying and volunteering i think i had about three volunteer jobs on the go at one time okay. you know and, and you, you're pretty skint as a student and you know you you dressed as some historical character because not all the volunteering you can get is in the collections department where you want to work yep. so you just take what you can you know I'm dressed as a historical uh, character being kicked by some children and you do wonder <laughs> why am I doing this <laughs> but it, you know hard work perseverance yes. all comes good in the end and Absolutely. it has 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one thing that certainly uh, we have in common. doesn't matter which side of the pond we're on, you know, it's, you've, you've got to find that in and it's very competitive and, you know, uh, people, people soon realize that even though in the grand scheme of things, the museum field is, is large. I mean, cause there's museums literally all over the world, but, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a very small field. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they play that game six degrees of, uh, of Kevin Bacon. And, you know, yes. it's, we, we all know each other and it rarely takes six we degrees do. to get there. We you probably, know? you probably applied for the same jobs. I think I applied for about 136 jobs before I got one. You know? Yeah, it's it's <laughs> not an easy field to get into and and a lot of people uh view view their museum jobs as you know it's it's dead man's shoes. You know, you're lucky enough to get it and you you keep it until you're you're done with it and they're bringing you out in a body bag and I I know a lot of folks who are like that and it's you know it seems macabre but you know you, you spend a lot of time trying to get into this field and doing it and and when you land something you're really passionate about uh, you'll be good and gosh darn that you to give it up you know so oh yeah they will have to carry me out kick it well in a box or kicking and screaming there you go <laughs> <laughs> so we we kind of already covered uh i was i was going to ask you what came first your interest in in history or firearms but it's it's apparent that you've been interested in history for a very long time um yeah but I'm curious, how how did your interest in, in firearms come about, particularly being over there uh, in England, where things are certainly far more restrictive than they are here? Absolutely. I mean, well, as you said, definitely history first. I was interested in I'm particularly always being kind of fond of the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't just through volunteering in museums and stuff that, you know, firearms was something I fell into. Um, as you say, it is a good, you know, in the UK, firearms, with the exception of, you know, there are exceptions. People do shoot, competition yes. shoot, people do go hunting. But to the majority of us, firearms are pretty alien. You've got the water pistols, maybe you grew up with some BB guns to play cops and robbers. And we, we just... We don't really know about them. So sure. it's, you know, to fall into firearms is a strange thing. But what, how I got into firearms was at university doing my second degree, okay. the museum studies course. One of the modules you could do, I think it was called Threat and Response. And Ooh. it was um, about the development of um, arms and armour. So not just firearms, we covered swords, armour and um, artillery and things. And it was um, period 1750 up to 1914 to the First World War. Um, it was led in conjunction with the Royal Armouries because the okay. university I went to was in kind of the next town from the city of Leeds. Um, one of their, their teacher was a historical consultant for the Royal Armouries. He's an excellent sword scholar too. So he'd bring his stuff in from his collection for us to have a play with. Cool. But also the curators, my predecessor, Peter Smithhurst, would come with some guns as well. And I was just, it, I like the swords and everything, don't get me wrong, but it was the guns, the, particularly the old muskets, the old British muskets, that I was a bit fascinated by how you read them, the markings on them. Yeah. Who's manufactured them? How do they, how do they work? How does this work? Why? What does this do to someone? You know, because mm-hmm. it, it is, it's pretty alien to us. So I was a bit fascinated by it. So... I think it was that it was that module that got me onto firearms and the technology surrounding firearms that really interested me. Okay. So when jobs came up at the Royal Art Race, I always applied for them. Sure. You know, I didn't necessarily get them, but I always applied for them. I started off actually at the Royal Art Race in the um, in the education um, department. So you do some gallery talks and things, and you would do some some education with children. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you had to do your own research around the objects in the handling collection and make up talks for them. So that's kind of, and, and then that triggered off something as well. And I thought this is really, really interesting. And gotcha. got into it, got into it there. Very cool. Really. Yeah, it was <laughs> cool. It was cool. It was yeah. a cool job. Yeah, 1750 to 1914. That's that's a huge span of of arms history to to try exactly. to cover there. That's 
uh, that's 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound sack. Um, <laughs> it's, it's impressive to, to try to cover all that. Uh, but one of the things that I want to talk about is, well, let's, let's delve into to 1914 and, and let's talk about World War I, the Great War and, and body armor and, and tie it into your book. Um, so, so tell us who, who was Casimir Zeglin and, and what, what is important about the armor that, that he developed? Casimir Zeglin, uh, originally born in Poland, um, he was a priest. He emigrated over over to the States, um, settled in Chicago, and um, turned into an inventor. I think he'd always tinkered with things, even back in Poland, turned okay. into an inventor. And it was one event, actually, um, that kind of shapes shapes this period of his life. So the, the, the mayor of Chicago, uh, his name, Car- Carter Harrison, there you go, uh, was assassinated in 1893. Um, and Zeglin, he was really, really affected by this, really upset and decided that he'd dedicate, you know, the next next couple of years of his life to creating something that, I th- and let me, uh, the quote is something about that will keep men safe in, in these positions of power um, who are left vulnerable by the attacks of fanatics. Mm-hmm. So he, he came up with these these bulletproof, armors well bulletproof vest basically and i think he trialed lots of different stuff from like metal bits of mattress um springs and hair oh, goodness. and all, all kinds of wow. things you're reading about it but he comes to silk so he's so it's just and it's threads of silk that he weaves into what we would you know silk cloth as we know it mm-hmm. um and would layer these in his um in his inventions and um, shoot at them and see if, see if they'd stop bullets, basically. So there's, he's really, really interesting. He's very hard to follow from someone that's tried to follow him for, you know, for five years. He writes a lot like the Riddler would, you know, because he, he doesn't want you copying. He doesn't want you copying and stealing his patents. Sure. So there's different patents. There's British patents. There's American patents. Um, there's different catalogues as well that have um, different different types of vest that will fit into these different patents, but you have to work out where what year the patent is as to what this could possibly be. Oh, so, it's, you know, it's a bit of a, it, it, was, it was quite a task um, trying to retrace his steps, but his experiment, he did live experiments as well, you know, to sell his product. So he begins by nailing his early patents to um, wooden posts and shooting them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. But that you know, we know today that that's because it's too rigid. You can't shoot. You need to shoot against something that's like a body. Right. Yep. He he begins to understand this. So take, taking his um, taking his invention to the next stage, he like he he goes and gets some bodies from the morgue and wraps the cadavers in his bulletproof cloth, shoots them. It's a bit different because they're not alive, so it's not live tissue. So right. then he, one of one experiment in Chicago, he wraps the cloth on a Great Dane and shoots oh, the dog. Yeah, the dog survives. And then he moves from, from live dogs to himself and gets his mates in to shoot him. Different, wow. cal- different calibers, um, different revolvers. And it's he doesn't keep a log of it. it the stuff that he's been shot with is reported by newspapers. So is it correct? Is it not? You, you're sure. never really going to have that true. What was that muzzle velocity? But right. we know that we know that he's been shot at by revolvers the end of the 19th century. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think I say in the book, he's either a remarkable illusionist or <laughs> this actually works. Sure. Yeah, that's it, it, talk about a, a different time. Getting getting cadavers from the morgue and then using a live Great Dane. I mean, that's just uh, we we just can't fathom something like that today. And uh, that's that's really mind boggling. Although uh, what what doesn't surprise me is to hear that he tested it on himself. I mean, because that was that was a common thing we encountered in the past, and you, you still see tests. I say there's videos of new body armor designers on YouTube, you know, pointing handguns at their stomachs and pulling the trigger. I mean, you gotta be, <laughs> you gotta be really confident in your product to, Absolutely. to try to do something like that. Um, 
you mentioned that he tried a bunch of different materials and, and then really settled on, on silk. So what is it about silk and what he was doing and how he was putting it together? You know, how, how is silk bulletproof? Well, silk is, I think, um, and I would have to check the science for all the, 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 the makeup of silk, but it is, I think, the strongest natural um, right. material that there is. Cotton is quite strong too. You know, mm. if you layer cotton up, not no nowhere near as strong as silk. Sure. Um, um, and what and it's to do with the weft as well, how it's been weaved. And um, he he began a partnership with um, a fellow a fellow Polish gentleman, another inventor. His name was Jan Seis Pashnik, but I can never pronounce. So apologies, <laughs> apologies for that pronunciation. Um, and he actually invented the manufacturing machine that would weave this silk cloth so it was it would become standardized because before then he bless him Siglin was doing it by hand so there may have been a few gaps you know <laughs> for bullets sure. to go through. so everything was standardized and um so they started that business relationship up, okay. um in the early part of the project but you know Zeglin, i think he was a clever man i think he knew about these silk the, the capability of silk I can't prove how he knew about it, but if you look back at the history of arms and armor, the Chinese are using silk to um, quilt clothes for battle in the sure. 6th and 7th centuries, you know, to prevent against punchy wounds. And then there's lots of Japanese armor, I think it's another pronunciation, Kiko armor, which has metal plates in it as well as silk. Okay. That, can, that can stop arrows. Um, and, you know, you hear tales. You hear, again, it's hear, hearing tales, isn't it? But um, the uh, Zeglin scholar, the Zeglin scholar, my uh, colleague in Poland, uh, Dr. Slaramir Lotzi, he would tell me of revolver duels, you know, fought in the in, in the States and, you know, people wearing silk, silk and then being okay, even though they've been shot. So that's how it got to the bullets, really thinking, okay, it's fine being pierced by an arrow or a sword, but a bullet, you know, my opinion, is a bit stronger. So, But Zeglin, how did he get to silk? We don't know. He never told us, because remember, this guy's the Riddler. <laughs> but <laughs> if you think about um, the Chicago um, 1893, just that Carter Harrison had been to the Chicago Exposition, the Columbian Exposition, in okay. 1893, and there, is a, there was a Jap big Japanese pavilion of arms and armour yeah. Did he go? Did he have a look? Did he see this silk armor and think, ah, silk, why have I not been tinkering with that? Right. Can't prove it. Never know. It's a nice idea. But sure. somehow Zeglin gets to silk. He has this partnership um, with Jan. Uh, but fortunately, they hate each other. They hate each other. And um, <laughs> they don't get along. Um, I think Ze Zeglin, you know, manages to get a machine over in the States um, Jan has one over in, in Poland and, you know, he's privy now to Zeglin's patents. This is maybe perhaps why Zeglin was so coy, because he started producing some um, on the continent in Europe. Mm -hmm. We don't know who for. He boasted the King of England and he boasted the Kaiser. But, you know, I've, I've got connections with the Royal Collection. They're like, we've never seen anything like that here. At least. <laughs> <laughs> think, yeah. Was it just a marketing ploy? Sure. We don't know. And also these heads of state that are buying this, they're not going to be very happy if the creator of it is saying, yeah, this guy's wearing it. This guy's wearing right. it. This guy's wearing it. Would be assassins are not going to wait for the torso, are they? If they right. know they're wearing a bulletproof vest. Right. So got to be don't, discreet. You've got to be discreet. We don't really know who had these silk bulletproof armors gotcha um but we do know that silk is bulletproof from some of the tests gotcha that, that i've been doing so. so so we'll talk about the tests uh here here in a minute but one of the things i want to talk about is you know we're talking about different different important people and heads of state uh who who may or may not have owned these pieces and to, to bring it back to your book, we've, we've got to talk about the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his assassination in Sarajevo in, in June of 1914. And so do we know if the Archduke owned either one of Zeglin's pieces or any of the other pieces that were on the market at the time? We do not, I'm afraid. 
Um, well, I would, you know, there's rumours of it. It's written up in newspapers, but you do not believe everything that you read in them, do you? Sure. Um, the, you know, viable proof in, in my, as a material culturist, would be that's the bulletproof vest that right. Franz Ferdinand had. He wasn't necessarily wearing it at the time, but he did have one. Um, so we don't know if he had one. Okay. Seglin was interviewed um, in a Polish journal that I had my colleague in Poland translated uh, for me. And he, he, Zeglin thinks that Franz Ferdinand had one, but he doesn't know, which suggests to me that he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been the guy who sold it to him being over in the States. It would have come from size patch from Jan size patchnik. Um, but we just, we just don't know. We can't prove it. I mean, the tunic um, that he was wearing, his um, Austro-Hungarian military tunic. Right. On the day is in um, the Vienna um, Military Museum, HGM in Vienna. You can see it. It's on display. It's They've a remarkable thing. They've got his car too, don't they? They have his car. Yeah. They, have, um, they have all the conspirators um, Browning 1910s because it wasn't just one that Princhett was using. There was, right. you know, that that was the, the Black Hand's gun of choice that day. So right. they've got all of those. They've got the one um, that was used to shoot the Archduke and his wife, Sophie. Um, they've got some amazing things. It's well worth a visit. Well worth a visit if anyone's in Vienna. Um, but the tunic is on display. You can see where the bullet hole went in. There's blood on it still. You can see where it was slashed to get the Archduke out. Sure. Um, also, not on display, but what they have um, in storage is his undershirt, so his vest, basically, right. um, that is also covered in blood. So to me, I'm thinking... Where's the bulletproof vest? If you've got his undershirt, you've got what the guy was wearing. You've got his trousers. Why is you know why would someone take this off? Right. Why would hide you hide it? that? Yeah, that's interesting. But it, yeah, it's it, and and then I was thinking, ooh, well maybe it's maybe the silk has incorporated into his military tunic. Oh. So, you know, yes. So that then I started kind of trying to zoom in, and I actually went to see it and. Yeah, there's no silk in it, and it's okay. confirmed. It's confirmed by um, by um, by them that there is no silk woven into this. I think they've had this before, right? Probably. <laughs> and yeah. um, the director of that museum and um, the chap in charge is actually his specialism is the um, uniforms of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So he knows. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Go to the source. Right. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. There's no silk in it. Gotcha. Isn't yeah, that so that would have been a, a really neat way to do it because obviously it, it was just as much of a, a concern then as it is today of Absolutely. trying to trying to hide uh, a bulletproof vest under material. I and mean, that's why a lot of heads of state today, even you know, you, they just have incredibly great security teams, uh, you know, the Secret Service and, and whatnot, because it it just doesn't look good to see your head of state walking around all bulked up. Uh, with with Absolutely. all this armor. Absolutely. That was a big thing, particularly in the in the late 19th century. There was this, you know, the trust between the people and the, the chaps running your country. They will come and do these state visits and they will come and be near the people. Right. And um, as it respects, the people will not try and molest them in any way or shoot them or any way. You know, that was the thing. So maybe, maybe Franz Ferdinand was just a bit overconfident about his popularity. Um, in, right. Yeah. That, that, who knows? Again, every, we don't know. Every politician likes to think everybody loves them, you know? <laughs> so uh, we've got, we've got Zeglin testing his stuff against wooden posts and cadavers and great Danes and then himself. Uh, and, and it's one thing to, to look at his tests through the, the inventor's eyes, but it's another thing to try to, replicate the tests and the results so that we have more of a controlled environment, more of a modern environment. And so one of the things you did was actually had uh, reproductions made of, of the vests and we're using uh, the Model 1910 pistols that are in your collection to shoot at them. So where, if, if Zeglin's armor is, is kind of a, a mystery, how did you guys go about having reproductions made? Yeah, well, we got um, uh, commissioned a very, very good um, historical costume maker, um, Kevin Morley, 
He was absolutely excellent. I went through all all the information that we had, <laughs> all the patents, all, all this, um, what Zeglin had written, um, what I thought and what he thought, obviously, because that's his field. He's he's very good at, you know, making historical costumes from, you know, with a task like this. Sure. And, um, you know, I wasn't far off, but he, um, he created... Um, well, I think it was three full vests that he created in the end of Kevin. And, oh, wow. Oh, hundred. Well, not hundreds, that's an exaggeration, but a good number of sample squares because obviously silk, it's not cheap. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so rather than creating, you know, full full vests to shoot where the Archduke was shot, um, we did sample squares. But also, you know, a big learning curve for me as well. That I'm not a forensic scientist. I read things, you know, obviously about forensic science and body backings and what doubles as a, a body. So working very closely with the forensics team too, I learned about how to properly replicate the human body. You know, was up till like 4 a.m. some nights baking something called Roba Plastilina, um, <laughs> making sure it never dropped below a certain temperature. And wow. then there was also making sure that the historic muzzle velocities were correct because a 380 ACP today is a bit different from that of 1914. So, yeah. you know, being shown how to download ammunition, it, it's not something a curator really does, you know. Sure. So that was really interesting too i think i'm going off point a little bit what, what no was no the you're, you're fine we were we were talking about uh how how the vest samples were made and, and yeah. you know and that's that's fascinating uh to know that you know not only are are you trying to get you know it's not just about getting the material of the vest right you've you've obviously you got to have the right gun you got to have the right ammo and like you said downloading to make sure you're yeah. you're hitting the proper velocities so that your tests aren't skewed and and you've got to be shooting at the right distance. So how yeah. how far was, was Princip from the Archduke? And what were you well, replicating? It, it's reported point blank. So um, two meters, though, some of the sources went to. So we need to, to make sure that that historic muzzle, muzzle velocity, because we had to shoot through a chronograph, obviously. Sure. We had to make sure that the point at which it reaches that, which was the center of our chronograph, was where we needed to hit the Archduke. Right. And so all this math, it was a lot of math. It was, it was, you know, things that I'd, I'd never thought of. So it was really interesting to do. But yeah. with regards to with regards to building these these vests, we t we kind of took it patent by patent. So having read the first patent that was that was full of wool and canvas as well as silk, and had something called pasteboard, which was it's like a book bind. It's like cardboard, really. Okay. The back. I knew that's probably not going to work because that's too rigid. But we still right. got to we still got to build it and shoot it and see. And um, well, you know, it shows how much I know because we shot it first with um, a replica Colt Navy, okay, just a black powder gun, and it actually stopped it even though it was rigid. Oh, so something yes, yeah, something like that will work against okay. you know, a black powder revolver. Yes, that's not that's what England was using, but it is good to know, isn't it? Yeah. So then I think this was the first test and I was, you know, quite excited. I wasn't curated and I think I was um was my first World War researcher or just been just been made assistant curator. So this was all pretty exciting for me. So mm -hmm. we got the um the Browning model nineteen ten. And at this point we'd not downloaded anything, we were just seeing what silk would do against bullets. Sure. So it was a, a modern 380 that we were using, um, just against a bit of ballistic gel at the time. Sure. And um, I shot it, missed, of course, because I can't <laughs> hit topic. <laughs> so I think Jonathan had to shoot it for me, actually. Shot it, and it, it just went straight through. Like, it went straight through and lodged it. We put some soap at the back, too. So okay. Like, oh, it doesn't work, does it? And we were like, but it stops, you know, the black powder. So I got another sample and I put two in front of each other and then shot it again with the brown in 1910 and it stops it. And this, this, this 380 bullet had lodged in the second layer of silk in the second vest. So that's when I thought, it's about how much silk you have in, isn't it? Logically, right. it's about how much silk. It's ripping through all this crap that's in there, <laughs> but it's the silk that's catching it. And right. again, it's the football net, isn't it? Analogy. Sorry, soccer, soccer net.
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just kept thinking of soccer, soccer nets and how much silk you would need and trying to right. work out how much silk or what, what Zeglin thought for a handgun. Mm-hmm. Although he never writes that he used a self-loading pistol. But, um, you know, sure. he doesn't write a lot of things. Um, <laughs> You know, so I knew, I knew back in 2014 that this actually might work. I don't think he was a magician. I think, I think it, it might work. Okay. Which is really interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. Absolutely. So, so you, once you get the, the material construction down and you've got the right gun at the, at the, the right velocity with the right load of powder in there. So you, your tests determine that it's, it's going to stop this bullet. Um, so I, I know, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. Oh. That, that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. And you know, this was about, this was four years before I actually got to, Deglin's final patent, final type with the what I would deem the, the most viable version of this this armor that that would have been sold to a head of state. Mm-hmm. Um, so even before then, I'm thinking, oh, this could work. This could work. Right. Um, but the, you know, there's also you know people say to me, yeah, but he was shot in the head, and I was like, he wasn't shot in the head. He was He's shot in the, the neck. neck then. Right. He was hit in the neck. Um, but it's the jugular, jugular, and he was actually hit. Yeah. You can't see me because this is a podcast. But it's a bit lower than than a collar would be. So it's where a, a, a bulletproof vest would end. However, Zeglin must have thought of this because we, we discovered a um, a British patent for a Zeglin vest that had protection up to just underneath your chin, basically. Okay. So it had a, a silk layer in there too. Confirmed this with my contacts in Poland. Yes, you know, we think that Zeglin made them high-necked versions, we'd call them. Okay. So a high-necked version did exist. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a patent for it. I don't know if he ever made it because right. we never found one. Um, sure. So the final vest that we tested um, was a high-necked patent um, with an inch of silk running all the way through it. So an wow. inch of silk up the front, up the back, into into the neck. It's a and lot of silk. That's the one silk. we tested. Oh, it cost a fortune, and it I, weighed I, a ton. That weighed was going to be my next question: is how much did it weigh? Do you recall? Oh, I'd have to check my book. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remember weighing it, thinking. Let's see. Mm. <laughs> I remember thinking, oh, this this probably you couldn't probably wear this. It, it, the point points we've said. Right, yeah, it would have been very cumbersome and 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 obvious. Would, oh, right, yeah, it would have looked very weird if he's kind of walking like a like a robot there, you know, not really able to to move his arms and and things. So that's it. All comes down to feasibility. Would you like it in pounds or kilograms? Uh, pounds, please. <laughs> Twenty pounds. Twenty pounds. Okay, and then kilograms because we do have some some Brits that as <laughs> nine well. Ki- nine kilograms. So nine kilograms. Nine kilograms. Twenty you, pounds. Wow. You don't want to be. You won't. You know. You don't. You're not going to walk around with that. So right. you know, which you know made me think. Have we got this wrong? Right. <laughs> but because but that's, one doesn't exist, I don't know. But right. going from what Zeglin said, um, you know, the square the square meterage to weight. That's how we had to try and work it out. Sure. But an inch of silk is, is going away a lot. Yeah. You figure 20 pounds and then you're strapping on a, a wool military uniform and it's late June. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's going to die a heat stroke, let alone an assassin's bullet, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so. But, you know, and this was this was he would have perfected this by the turn of the century. So this is 14 years before the Archduke's assassination. Right. So he would have had time, you know, they would have had time to, to fix it. Mm-hmm. He doesn't stop producing these things, but this is just because I've got the dated patent. So I'm right. just making it to this. The, gotcha. There may be, you know, things where he's he's gone back and rectified it that I just still haven't found. Gotcha. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was quite a sight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what we did on the final test was um, we shot we shot it in the exact place in the neck where mm-hmm. the archduke had been shot, 
and we shot it in the abdomen for his wife, for Sophie, because she was obviously sure. killed by the same um, gunman with the yep. same weapon at the same distance. It just hit her in a different place. So the results in the end of the book, <laughs> which I won't reveal because I don't think my publishers would like that, right? Um, <laughs> will give you an answer as to who might have survived that gotcha. and might not have. Well, and speaking of surviving, and, and I know this is something you definitely want to touch on because we talked about this briefly before, is, you know, everyone's incredibly oversimplified version of World War I is the Archduke Franz Ferdinand gets killed and it creates a snowball effect of alliances and World War I happens, which, of course, ends up giving us World War II and, you know, shapes everything to today. So it would be incredibly easy and simple to say, well, if the Archduke had been wearing one of Zeglin's uh, silk vests and he had survived, we could have avoided World War I and World War II and, and all of that, and the world would be a completely different place. Um, but, but it's not as simple as that, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid not. But this question, I get asked it a lot. And, and I also get misrepresented in it because, the, you know, the fact that we've created this, like we have the answer to the prevention of, of what the, the First World War, the Second World War, right. you know, and, and why, why the world is a mess. No, <laughs> absolutely not. I mean, I don't feel I, I'm really qualified to answer this. You know, would the First World War have happened? I'm not a historian. I don't know the, you know, the great detail, the great historical sources, but from where I'm standing, you know, Europe was a tinderbox waiting to go off yeah. at that point in time. The alliances already existed. Um, right. it, it wasn't like he said he wasn't shot and then we all got together and, and picked sides. It wasn't like that at all. Um, he was skating on thin ice. Sure. So, you know... This it was it was the cherry on top of the cake. It just wasn't the icing. It was the cherry. It was right. We've got an excuse now. Let's, right. Let's let's, let's kick um, it off. Let's kick it off and let's let's um, yeah. Um, but you know some some historians. I've watched debates over it, and you know I I don't fully understand it myself, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wouldn't dare try and answer that. That's I'm not a historian. I'm a curator. Um, I'll leave that to them. But, you know, if he'd not been murdered, would he have been sh shot at? Would he, You know, if he would have been shot at and survived, would that have been a different thing? Or you still, right. you've, you've had a go at him. Or right. just nothing happened in Sarajevo. Um, maybe the war would have started when it did. Maybe something else would have happened in July. Right. Until yeah, we some get other, other, <laughs> some other world leader. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Who knows? Um, what is important, though, about this, I think, um, I'm quite protective of Casimir Zegli. I think he's an absolute genius that arms and armor scholars have forgotten about. You know, when I mentioned it, um, no one really knows about him in, 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 yeah. in, in, in the UK. Um, it's different over, you know, Chicago and over in Poland, but he's not a celebrated inventor. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why, because this is this is pretty. It's groundbreaking. Genius. It's pretty out yeah. there, isn't it? Yeah, um, I, I'd never heard of him till I read your book. Uh, it's you know. I'd never heard of him till I um till I did some crazy crazy googling in Polish, and I just thought, <laughs> why 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 do why are we not celebrating this man and his invention? Right. Yeah, it's fascinating <laughs> stuff, and and so um. <laughs> I ask everyone this question on the show, and uh, I'm, I'm, you're going to have to take it in a slightly different direction than than what we've been talking, because I, I think, uh, and you can correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but I would think if you could meet Zeglin, you certainly would want to, because then he could answer uh, a lot of the unknown questions that his his Riddler writings uh, do not address. But but I'm not going to make it that easy on you. So <laughs> uh, instead. Uh, what firearms designer, living or dead, would you want to meet and why? Ooh, so many. Because, right. you know, uh, you know. <laughs> um, okay, okay, let me, oh, I'm going to have to think. What do I find fascinating? 
most most fascinating out of the 28,000 objects that we have. Right. <laughs> Not an easy choice. Um, okay. Um, the Lorenzoni system. Michele Lorenzoni of yes. um, Tuscany and his breech loading repeating system. Yes. Because we don't actually know if he did invent it. It's just actually, right. he probably did. It's just attributed to him, isn't it? So right. that'd be a question like did you invent this right. <laughs> did, did you actually invent this did yeah you, um where did you get the idea from yeah Cause yeah because it, it's it, a, it's a fascinating system it's a fascinating system you know and we don't even know when he came up with it is it 1660 1660 1680 nobody really knows but right. it's used right you know this system is used right up until the 19th century even though you know there's elements of it that are severely dodgy oh yeah <laughs> and it, it can take your face off um yeah. you know and he knows that and he creates doesn't he he creates different versions of it I, right. I think is it one of the grand dukes it's one of the medici dukes isn't it is it colin the third that has sure. the 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 best version of it let's say that's that's in a museum in florence i've seen that gun okay um so the the very best version of it but then you know we've got things in our collection that's like it but it's not made yeah. by it's not by made by lorenzoni sure. uh, there's the cookson's version there's a uh, cartel's version there's lots of different versions yeah. so it, it's obviously so good and groundbreaking that you know it is even though there is a chance it will blow up um <laughs> it's been used and and as i say over a matter of hundreds of years until yeah. the revolver really, until the, you know we have different different ways of doing it sure so i just think it's, it's pretty fascinating it okay. is i'll go for him that's a great choice, Lorenzoni. That's it is. It's a great choice, and it's it's an awesome mechanism. And I've I've had you mentioned Cookson. I've I've had the opportunity to to take apart a, a Cookson rifle and and really get to to explore that mechanism. You know, and it's one thing you can have someone describe how it works for this for this. Well, I think it's very. Lot difficult to describe how it works well and that's what i'm saying is you know someone <laughs> someone can try to describe it to you and and you might nod along and go uh-huh uh-huh you know but but you don't really understand how this repeating flintlock design works until you can actually hold one in your hands and and work the mechanism and better yet take the mechanism apart so that you can see you know the back side of the locks and how everything is is interfacing with one another it's it, it is an even more complicated mechanism uh, than than you would think to to have yeah. someone try to struggle and describe it once once you get it into pieces you're like my gosh how did how did someone come up with this and that's like you said that's a perfect question to ask Lorenzoni is how in the world did you envision this because I I can't imagine no I'm not the most creative person in the world either but but I can't imagine sitting down and going you know I want to create a, a certain type of firearm and and this is how I'm gonna do it because it, what he came up with or, or whoever he, he got the idea from, I, I wouldn't even begin to be able to come up with that design. It's so, it's so delicate and intricate. Um, it, it's just, it's fascinating, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. So him, yeah, I'll go for one of the old ones rather than, rather than a modern one. Who we can still ask? Because you can still ask them. <laughs> that's true. Yep there there are some you can we can still ask and and that's good. But no, Lorenzoni, I, I like that choice. Uh, no one no one has said that yet. We've we've had a few repeats uh, on on the show, um, and that's okay. They've they've been good ones. But uh, but Lorenzoni, I, I like that choice. Uh, Excellent. Well, well, Lisa, I, I really appreciate you taking some time to come on the show. Uh, there will be a, a link in the show notes and the description where you can pick up a copy of the book, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the Era of Assassination. It is a fantastic piece um, for those of us listening in, in the States. They do ship international, which is, of course, how I, how I, how I got my copy. Um, but it's a it's a great read. Uh, I highly recommend it if you're interested in World War One and, and arms technology and, and things of that nature. So hopefully we've we've piqued your interest today and, and you'll go out and pick up a copy of the book. Um, so once again, Lisa, thank you so much for being on the show. I, I appreciate you coming on with us. An absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.
Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the High Caliber History Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed recording it. Please feel free to share it with someone who you think would enjoy it as well. And as a reminder, we are entirely viewer supported. So if you want to help ensure that more episodes like this come out in the future, please consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. There will be a link in the description. Thanks, and we'll see you again on the next episode.